Welcome and thank you for joining yet another of ADGM's webcasts. Since we started this series with the objective to help, we've tried to deal with what's important for our business community. Many times, uh, especially at the outset, we talked about defensive moves, how to deal with uncertainty, with problems. Today, at our last webcast, before we take a break for a month, we look in what I hope uh, is another direction, M&A that are picking up again in the region, and a good indicator, I hope, on willingness to invest and belief in the future. Here to help us are a number of very well-connected and knowledgeable industry experts and a great moderator, Hesam Kalantar. Welcome to all of you. Hesam, take it away, please. Martin, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon to everyone and to my uh, panelists. Um, we have a rather ambitious agenda today to talk about all things M&A. Uh, very briefly, a little something about myself. I'm Hassam Kalantar. I'm the founder and managing partner of a boutique law firm here in the UAE, KBLG. We do corporate commercial work um, of, all, of all stripes. Uh, we're quite active in M&A, uh, joint ventures, we do a bit of corporate finance and we advise US and European clients who are exploring market entry into the GCC countries, uh, whether by way of investment or they're looking to expand their operations. And we also do some outbound work advising on investments in places like the US originating here in the region. Um, I have been in Dubai in the UAE generally for 12 years uh, prior to starting my law firm a couple of years ago. Uh, I was in an in-house role, and prior to that, I've been at large international law firms, both here in the region and in New York. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to my panelists now to introduce themselves. I'll start with Ahmed. Ahmed, over to you. Good afternoon all. My name is Ahmed Osman. I'm a partner and co-head of investment banking for a Middle East investment banking firm called De Novo Corporate Advisors. Uh, De Novo was established around 10 years ago and we're a leading advisory firm in the field of M&A, uh, debt and uh, capital raisings and restructurings. I've been with De Novo for eight years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 12 years as an investment banker within financial institutions um, within Morgan Stanley, UBS and Citigroup. And with that, I will uh, pass on to Majid. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, first of all, I would like you know, to start by thanking um, ADGM for inviting us to participate in this forum, um, for giving us the opportunity to share some of our thoughts uh, with the audience. Uh, I hope uh, those you know, um, either viewing this live or those you know, who have the opportunity to go over the recording later are safe uh, and healthy along with their loved ones. My name is Majid Al Mismari and I head the JP Morgan Chase Investment Banking business in the UAE. Uh, I have a responsibility for leading teams uh, who um, provide financial advice to governments, government-related entities, uh, corporates, uh, as well as financial institutions across uh, M&A, equity capital markets, as well as debt capital markets. Uh, I've been with JP Morgan for the last uh, five years. Uh, uh, prior to this, uh, I was uh, a member of uh, um, the team of Rothschild uh, as a director um, for financial advisory here in the region. Uh, the bulk of my experience, you know, back then revolved around um, debt restructuring, 
um, 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 and debt refinancing for a lot of the um, um, businesses, you know, in our part of the world, as well as you know, M&A and, and, and IPO. Um, um, prior to that, I started my career with HSBC back in 2006, um, but I started working off the university back in 1999 with the Tsalat. With that, I would like you know to um, pass on the talking spot uh, to my colleague Tahar. Thank you very much, Majid, much appreciated. Um, thank you very much also to uh, Team ADGM as well as Team KBLG uh, for moderating this. Um, it's a wonderful being on such a panel of distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, my name is Tahir Majidi. Uh, I uh, lead EY's energy business across the Middle East, North Africa uh, within our strategy and transactions vertical, which composes of M&A, strategy, capital and debt advisory, and a number of other discrete disciplines. Within each of those discrete disciplines, we have an energy focused team. I also happen to be one of two partners within our MENA M&A practice. Uh, my background is investment banking as well as private equity uh, with a historical focus of the energy sector. Uh, thank you very much. With that being said, I'll pass it back over to Hissan. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, Majid, and Tahir. So as we launch into the panel discussion, I just wanted to say by way of an opening remark that as much as global M&A was subdued over the spring because of the pandemic, of course, the resurgence of blockbuster deals just in the space of the last couple of months has been nothing short of extraordinary. In fact, I read just today that eight deals uh, valued at 10 billion dollars plus were signed globally over the, the last six uh, weeks uh, alone. So this suggests that M&A is coming roaring back um, despite the pessimistic outlook just frankly a couple of months ago. Um, now when you look at our own region, which is of course our focus today, the picture may not be too dissimilar in that there have been a number of large landmark transactions uh, in recent months and by virtue of those deals, where the MENA region generally stands in terms of deal value for the first half of 2020 is quite consistent, quite consistent with, its, uh, with its standing last year. In fact, I think, all told, um, we've had a pretty good first six months. Um, now, that, of course, is skewed towards very large headline-grabbing transactions, often with governmental involvement. Um, and It'll be interesting to see whether the momentum of the resurgence in M&A globally, uh, particularly uh, in the US and to some extent in Europe, will carry over to this region and whether those landmark deals are in fact representative of the, of the re regional landscape as a whole. And so with that, uh, let me turn to our distinguished panel. I'd like to put the first question to Marjit uh, and ask a broad question, Marjit. So what I'd like to know is what kind of deals are being brought to market uh, at present uh, and you can go back if you want to a few months uh, and move forward just interested to know the sorts of transactions you're seeing uh, the sorts of sectors sure um Hassan, thank you so much um i think you know it is uh, quite obvious that the landmark transactions that have been announced and or revealed in the last you know couple of months uh, were primarily state slash government sponsored uh, transactions in some of the real economy uh, sectors. Um, and that is um, not quite a strange. Um, um, and I think, you know, maybe in response to your earlier remark, when you said, you know, um, the rebound in MA activity, particularly in the developed world, um, have primarily been led, you know, by private sector companies. Um, I guess, you know, in our part of the world, because of the large presence um, of government-related entities in the local economies in the region, um, you know, those were primarily in the driving seat. Um, and these, you know, GREs as major and reference shareholders, 
uh, you know, have aspired, you know, to achieve a number of objectives in basically initiating you know, some of these deals. Um, so to start with, um, there always has been um, um, a sort of a feeling that, you know, um, a specific government in a specific country uh, happens to be an investor or a major uh, shareholder in a number of similar companies within a specific sector. Um, and I guess, you know, um, in recent years, that has made both governments think about streamlining ownership uh, and it's trying you know, to bring those companies together by, by way of a major or an amalgamation um, um, in order to create um, um, national champions, uh, you know, companies you know, with large scale within their respective uh, sectors. Uh, but they also do this taking into consideration that you know, these transactions you know, have to make sense. There is an industrial, there is a strategic uh, fit um, um, and there is um, an aspired financial benefit that can be reaped by all uh, uh, stakeholders of such a transactions. Also, governments um, in our part of the world um, seems to be quite focused on value uh, maximization and augmentation uh, in the short run. Um, by trying, you know, to put all of these deals together, uh, um, uh, and hopefully, in due course, the ability to realize the fruits of those mergers, um, either by way of, you know, um, re-IPOing, uh, re you know, some of these businesses, um, you know, taking them, you know, um, and sharing, you know, the ownership, you know, with some of the financial or strategic investors, etc. Uh, and lastly, I would say here, um, um, attracting FDI. Um, has been a major tool um, um, and a major objective for various governments, you know, in our part of the world as part of their large reform um, um, programs. Um, and therefore, I think it is um, not uh, completely um, surprising to see state-sponsored transactions, you know, taking place. Uh, let's not forget the fact that um, um, Having um, um, a government-related entity involved in a transaction uh, makes it easier to execute you know, a deal, whether that is from a valuation point of view, um, commercial point of view, uh, and often you know, from a regulatory point of view, whereby the regulator you know, will tend to become, um, um, uh, so to speak, um, a friend dealer. Uh, in, in the way you know, they approach you know, those deals. Uh, if I take you on your first inquiry, what sort of um, you know, deals are we seeing? You know, which sectors you know, um, 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 you know, those transactions are taking place? I guess you know, it is safe to say that you know, the oil and gas, um, as well as the financial services sectors, um, you know, top um, you know, the list in that respect. Um, um, so within the oil and gas you know, space, uh, we've seen a number of industrial you know, com combinations um, you know, um, uh, in a number of countries, you know, in, in, in MENA. Uh, but we also have seen an attempt, you know, by a number of um, oil and gas players to try to um, invite uh, investors into the capital structure to some of their assets, uh, whether that is, you know, in the midstream space, downstream space, uh, et cetera. Um, 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 and maybe the last thing, you know, from me, when it comes to the financial services, uh, you know, sector, um, um, there has been a number of bank mergers in the last, you know, couple of years. Um, I guess, you know, um, um, major shareholders, particularly government related entities, as well as, you know, major uh, private investors in these banks, um, do appreciate that um, there are headwinds um, as we go into the future. Um, you know, COVID is, you know, one of them. But prior to COVID, everyone, you know, was expecting that, you know, with low oil prices, um, with low interest rates, um, um, you know, have those pose major headwinds. Um, um, and I guess, you know, the, the region largely now is experiencing um, what I could describe, you know, as um, uh, not only a triple whammy, but four, four whammies. Um, low oil prices, um, um, low interest rates, um, 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 COVID, uh, and then, you know, we've got uh, an expat population ex uh, exodus. Uh, all of this, um, you know, will indicate that financial services institutions, you know, in our part of the world um, are likely, you know, to face um, challenges, you know, going forward. And therefore, the creation of 
um, you know, larger scale entities putting, you know, players together might make sense. No, no, that's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, the points around valuation um, to the extent to which the FDI initiatives um, have actually borne fruit and we're going to touch on reforms around the legislation that will hopefully facilitate more FDI. Those are things that I'd like to explore a little bit more as well as the drive for consolidation. But your talk about oil and gas is a good dovetail into Tahir's expertise because the Tahir, obviously, a lot of these iconic deals of recent weeks and months, uh, even though some of them are very close to home right here in the UAE. Um, can you elaborate on, on the drivers? Uh, I mean, energy transactions have always been important to the region. Uh, can you explain what is driving those uh, today and maybe even extrapolate a little bit into the future? With pleasure. Thank you very much for that, Hissam. And I think what Majid mentioned was extremely valid um, and, and sets a good precedence. Um, before doing so, I'll, I'll start off by saying our M&A team in EY is exceptionally sector focused. That's not just within m and that's within our broader strategy and transactions business. Energy plays an important part of that. Consumer products, retail play an important part of that. TMT, social infrastructure, as well as financial services. The reason I mentioned that is later on in the discussion, we'll try and bring about some of the defensive sectors that we're seeing a lot of activity in from an M&A perspective. Obviously, energy is quite cyclical, but nonetheless, an important part of what's happening here in the region from an M&A perspective. Now, to answer your question directly, there's one fundamental reason for that, and that is efficiency. And by efficiency, whether it's operational efficiency or alternatively, whether it's efficiency from a capital structure perspective. And by that, fundamentally, it means that when you look at this efficiency, there are platforms that are being set up for growth in the future. And it's really important to note that more so and more so, even though a lot of these entities within the energy sector are fundamentally government-related entities, the drive to be profitable, the drive for bottom line, the drive to ensure a sustainable future moving forward and allowing these businesses to grow, whether it be organically within their own perimeter or alternatively, inorganically outside of their perimeter is really, really important. Now, more so and more so, we're seeing the Middle East per se within the oil and gas sector, the Middle East is moving east. And that is because that's where the end market is driving towards. And by that, it means I think more so and more so we'll see, and this is of course needless to mention publicly available information, we'll see more and more interest within Southeast Asia because fundamentally that's where the end market is. And that drive to be operationally efficient, that drive to be efficient from a funding and growth perspective is also an important discussion because when one looks at how these businesses are performing, it is more so moving away from the barrel and moving towards the downstream side of things, whether it's refineries, whether it's petrochemical facilities, whether it's the energy transition becomes an important part of that. So fundamentally, it's not so much moving away from hydrocarbons, it's how does one also look at moving away and diversifying the molecule across that value chain. So as I said, uh, downstream refineries, petrochemicals, retail become really, really important in that discussion. Um, and um, fundamentally, uh, what we will see in the future is uh, one, uh, international energy companies and national energy champions. Uh, and also we'll see uh, the word um, oil potentially be replaced with the word energy per se. So we're going to see much more diversified businesses here in the region, whether it be in the oil and gas side or something I'll quickly touch upon within the power and utility side. Within the power utility side, we're seeing a lot of market liberalization. We're seeing a lot of changes fundamentally in the historic IWPPs where you saw by definition integrated water and power plants now you're seeing a decoupling of that effect because fundamentally the base loads and the peak loads of that are different. So because you will see these changes in regulation, because you'll see the market liberalization moving forward, you'll fundamentally see more secondary transactions 
interestingly enough, in my humble opinion, within the PNU space within the MENA region. So um, a very exciting time to be in the energy space here in the, in, in the Middle East, uh, because fundamentally um, a lot of these entities are um, proning themselves to uh, and, and positioning themselves for growth in the future. And we're very fortunate uh, uh, as uh, uh, EY to be uh, involved in quite a few of those situations. Back over to yourself, Mr. Thank you. Right. No, no, that's interesting. And certainly the deals that I've been reading, reading about uh, that have been recently announced, I mean, going back to the SABIC Aramco deal of what was it last year or maybe I think it closed uh, last year. But yeah, it seems to be about also entering into new 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 markets with these downstream products, right? So uh, moving away from upstream oil barrels and having more uh, specialized, say, chemicals and, and, and whatnot. Let's move away from the the energy space and even maybe from the government space. I'll turn it to over to you, Ahmed. I'm just interested to hear from you because you're maybe a bit more focused in in, in private M and A. I know you do the large ones, as, large deals as well from time to time, but but uh, uh, let's hear about what's going on in the more sort of everyday uh, m and in terms of what you've been seeing. Okay, I think in terms of the, the private space, um, and I'll say in a, a post-COVID world, what we've seen a lot more is um, growth acquisitions that are in very defensive sectors. They're either sort of COVID neutral or, or COVID friendly. Um, and a lot of the deals that, that we're seeing sort of make it sort of tangible. A lot of deals in sort of food, meat and poultry processing production. Um, we're seeing deals in pharma distribution, in a grocery uh, side. So things that are, that are more defensive in nature, healthcare services or other, you know, projects that, that we have that are, that are going on in the market. So basically sectors that are kind of neutral to, to positively Im impacted. And, and we're still seeing basically uh, demand, uh, particularly a lot of sort of strategic demand uh, in these in these segments. So, so you know, in terms of, let's say, the growth-led um, area of M&A in the private market, that's, that's what we're seeing. In terms of um, elsewhere, I think what's interesting is in the region, I think certainly for the period that I've been here over the last sort of eight to 10 years, um, it's the first time that we're seeing a real push towards um, consolidation uh, across basically a lot of the large groups and, and large family groups. And, and I think what we're seeing now is, you know, as the, um, you know, as the situation is positive for certain areas of the business, adversely impacted by others, there's a real degree of discipline that's coming through amongst a lot of family groups to decide what is core and what is non-core. And, you know, whereas in the past, very candidly, we, we may hear from groups that are looking to dispose, let's say, underperforming businesses, which are very challenging to do. Now they're much more amenable to coming into share for share deals, ceding control potentially, but in you know, but achieving uh, value maximization and, and cost savings, um, which I think is, is, is refreshing and, and is going to be very good for the market. Yeah, interesting. I mean, presumably, it's 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 difficult to uh, to for family businesses or family offices to part with non-performing or non-core assets when the valuations would be what they are. I mean, when you consider some of these legacy businesses, whether it's commercial leasing, aviation, automotive. I mean, these these sorts of businesses have gone through a lot of and are going through a lot of disruption. So, presumably, consolidating and and achieving cost savings is is, is more likely to happen than an actual sale uh, i would suspect but um, um let me let me ask uh, just on on the, the point about uh, consolidation because obviously we hear a lot about that we've got the bank mergers that i think uh, imagine alluded to uh, that happened in well back in 2017 we had the fab deal and then we've had a, a big three bank merger in 2019 there's what been one in saudi announced this year what other position, and I'll turn this over back to, to um, first to Majid, uh, what other sectors do you think are best positioned for consolidation? Um, uh, we were an overbanked country here in the UAE, arguably, and something seems to be done about that and maybe more of it will happen. What, others, what, what, other, what other sectors do you think deserve this treatment? Absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, I would conquer, you know, with what Ahmed, you know, have said, you know, earlier which is, you know, in a post-COVID environment, 
a clearly defensive sectors, you know, seems to be the flavor of the month. Uh, and they seems to be what investors, whether, you know, financial or strategic, uh, are quite keen, you know, to, um, you know, understand, uh, have a look at, uh, and or, you know, engage in a discussion, you know, with the major, you know, shareholders. Uh, but there is another aspect, you know, which I would like, you know, to add to do to this particular um, um, uh, point, which is, um, you know, consumer healthcare, education and payments uh, are likely to, to be contending for topping the list of sectors um, 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 that will be witnessing activity um, for the next you know, couple of months and into the future. I guess an interesting aspect or a trend we should also expect is some of the businesses operating in these four sectors are thinking long and hard, um, uh, saying, we understand that we are defensive and counter cyclical businesses. However, how can we ensure that we become more differentiated? And in that aspect, we're seeing many of them are trying you know, to think about adoption of tech, technology. So you think about consumer businesses, which has technology solutions. You think about healthcare businesses, which thinks about you know, technology as a platform for growth, whether that is uh, distant you know, diagnosis, um, um, you know, um, distance you know um, um, operating procedures you know in collaboration with other you know businesses or healthcare businesses elsewhere uh, within the education sector you know quite interestingly at least from um, our point of view at dp morgan is that a lot of the um, um, good size um, um, technology companies who happen to have who happen to have um, 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 an education focus have been telling us can you tell us more about education platforms in your part of the world, which has a scale and who could all of a sudden, and instead of being uh, only uh, a great provider of physical education and a limited provider of online learning, um, they can install you know, our solutions that allows them then you know, to operate um, whatever education model you know, one can think of, whether that is, you know, physical, whether that is fully online or, you know, a hybrid model. We're, we're seeing, you know, some of those, um, we're seeing, you know, some of those um, 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 uh, initiatives uh, and inquiries um, um, on a reverse basis uh, emerging, you know, in the region. And finally, in the payments space, um, uh, I guess we will be witnessing uh, a surge in activity whereby the regional players, you know, will be thinking about the regional players will be thinking about um, um, during COVID, um, you know, we were um, um, largely um, um, a beneficiary compared, you know, to other businesses. Um, are there any niche players in the region, you know, we should think of? Are there any um, smaller sized players uh, that we know they will struggle, you know, to grow on their own? Uh, and therefore, you know, it does make sense, you know, if, um, um, to, 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 to initiate such, you know, discussions, you know, with them. Right. Right. And, and obviously the, the COVID theme is one that we can't get away from uh, on, on today's discussion. Uh, eventually we'll move away from COVID. But before we do that, I wanted to turn to Tyra. I know uh, I wanted to get Tyra your take on, on obviously the word resilience is, is an overused one. I try to stay away from it, but I'll use it with, I mean, businesses are trying to be that, right? They're trying to be resilient and they're trying to strategize around resilient assets and protecting supply chains. And I, I think your deals speak to that um, aim as well. So can you tell us how much M&A has been uh, done as a means to, to make businesses uh, more resilient um, sure. in the face of what we've faced in the last few months? Sure, thanks, Hassan, with pleasure. Um, let me maybe provide a little bit of context. If you look at the trends that we've been heading towards over the last five to seven years, you know, these trends were trends that we saw happening over the medium to long term. I think what COVID has done is compress these trends and front end them and bring them to the fore much earlier. And I think the assistance of that happening is around uh, of the overarching issue of technology 
And I agree with what uh, my fellow colleague Majid mentioned, which is if you look at all the different sectors that Majid mentioned, which are fundamentally defensive, what is the overarching issue around that is, is technology. Now, there's a broader question here to ask, you know, when um, COVID hopefully, um, inshallah, goes away, right, is there going to be a rotation out of technology? And are you going to see some of the more cyclical sectors come back to the fore again? But what is for sure is the trends that we saw happening in front of our eyes that we saw over the next 15 to 20 years occurring, we've seen COVID really compress that down over the last three, four months and really kind of accelerate the growth of that. So for example, as EY within the MA space, we've been quite heavily involved in uh, cybersecurity transactions, for example. Um, and we've seen a lot of interest around the cybersecurity space. Um, secondarily, we've seen a lot of interest around, and um, Ahmed mentioned this, around the F&B and specifically agri space. And, um, and these are again, uh, you know, defensive sectors because fundamentally uh, given uh, the pause button that was pressed during the COVID period, these are sectors that really become important um, to not just the regional economies, but the global economies as a whole. If you look at food technology, that's going to become quite an interesting space to look at. So as I said, we saw trends happening over the medium to long term. We're seeing those trends accelerate. And by virtue of them being accelerated, we're seeing transactions happen in that space. And by definition, because transactions are happening in that space, for these defensive businesses, we're seeing uh, multiples uh, quite uh, quite uh, higher than what we would see normally. That being said, we'll leave that to the valuation discussions. But nonetheless, what we are seeing, and I think this is really, really important, is uh, uh, you know staying still is not the answer. I think the tectonic shift that has occurred over the last few months has caused um, uh, institutions, whether it be financial, whether it be government owned, whatever those nature of those institutions, really think about how they want to use this world pause and position themselves for the future. Yeah, well, that, that, that's fascinating. I mean, I think if we, live in, if we live in a world where cybersecurity is a defensive sector, and, and we do today, I mean, that tells you how far we've come from Indeed. how we used to define sectors in the past and in the not too distant past. Um, let me, so, so of course, Supply chain protection, yes, agri, obviously pharma would, would, would fall into that uh, and trying to build stakes um, and uh, relationships in that sector. Would, and you can see, you've obviously seen that happening uh, globally. I want to uh, just touch on, I, I think we would be remiss if we did not talk about cross-border M&A and uh, sort of attack this theme of FDI. Um, you know, obviously there's been the vision, as all of you have basically suggested is to make this place uh, business friendly for foreign capital, right? Um, and there's been a number of initiatives in that regard. We've got obviously this FDI law, which is largely untested. There's been a couple of deals done under it, but it was fleshed out only in March of this year when we got the positive list. Um, we've had much reform in just general corporate companies, regimes, uh, whether it's insolvency law or, or or a law of security, employment, and so on. General question, maybe I, I will go to Ahmed first for this. I, I, having advised on M&A deals for as long as you have in the region, can you tell us, as these reforms have come, and some of them have come quite thick and fast in the last couple of years, have you seen it, have you seen it move the needle in terms of FDI? Do you think that it's really now making this place markedly attractive for foreign investors? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, for f firstly, the region generally, notwithstanding ownership restrictions and others, has been open to doing deals. And I think that, you know, we worked on deals uh, across sectors where under various structural arrangements, you know, deals can be done, they can be done transparently. But I think obviously in certain sort of sectors that, that are more sensitive, we've had a lot of dialogues with um, particularly strategic parties that are keen to enter to the, into the market have a lot of value to add that been monitoring these these developments closely i have to say though candidly has that led in, in our experience to deals being done as a result of these changes i haven't seen sort of that much change but but certainly they are they are positive 
and you know they are leading to to increased interest right i mean sort of part of the concerns around you know uh, previously is you know the testability of other structures which which are in the in the market and this basically enables those concerns i think to to go away in, in certain sectors so right. in certain areas particularly sort of nominee structures and things like that uh, incidentally, I've been told to to spread the word to the audience that they can send in questions in the in the chat uh, through the chat function. So, um, and some are are starting to come in. Um, Majid, you've done a fair bit of restructuring work, obviously, um, and I think that well, the question is, you know, we've gone through a tough time, and the we're not out of the woods by far, right? Um, with 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 pandemic and all those other whammies as you described. Uh, locally, so um, how much is you know is there is there liquidity issues um, like sort of the prospects of default? Um, it, are you seeing M and A transactions come out of the the necessity of restructuring? Um, is that just just you know you, you need to just raise capital um, and and you know come to an arrangement with your creditors? Is that is that propelling M and A in in the region? Uh, I think it is, um, but you know, for one, you know, to uh, appreciate and understand whether you know M and A would be utilized, you know, as a tool to try to avoid um, or escape, um, you know, a liquidity crunch uh, and the inability of really good businesses in some of the interesting real economy sectors um, to um, meet their financial obligations. I think it is useful, you know, to try to compare and contrast the current crisis in which we are living, i.e. COVID, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the global financial crisis, you know, back in 2008, 9, and 10. Um, and I think back during the global financial crisis, one could have argued and said a lot of the companies um, did not necessarily have sustainable business models and operations. They were not financially managed well. Uh, and therefore, when the crisis took place, you know, m &A could not be considered to be uh, a tool to save them. Um, I think, you know, during, you know, COVID-19, um, 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 we've seen a number of really great businesses in this part of the world. Um, you know, businesses which have, um, you know, solid business uh, setups, great management teams, uh, appealing um, um, proposition and products, you know, to their customers. However, they have neglected, you know, to have a more rigorous um, financial management practices in place, uh, and therefore they face this massive liquidity crunch for um, um, for reasons beyond their control. Uh, uh, and therefore, um, um, uh, in my humble opinion, you know, these businesses, you know, today, um, you know, are possibly available. Um, either, you know, to strategic businesses from outside the world who are now saying <laughs> post-COVID-19, where should we focus? Where are the areas of growth around the world? Um, Amina stands out, you know, in that respect. Uh, and or, you know, financial sponsors, um, um, whether from the region or from outside the region, um, you know, who are um, who do have liquidity and who do have, you know, um, a, a firepower that needs to be deployed. Uh, and some of these businesses, you know, seems to be, you know, good. So, yes, indeed, uh, Hussam, I would tend to think that, you know, M&A, um, you know, could be used as an alternative for a lot of the regional good businesses to try to either avoid or escape, um, you know, have a severe liquidity crunch they are going through as we speak. Right, right, and and that's you know I would I would suspect as much. Um, uh, Tyre, I think it, it, for fear of getting a bit too granular, perhaps I, I just thought I would sort of put you on the spot, and uh, I'll do this to everyone though. Don't worry, and and just you know candidly, just tell me. So you know when you're negotiating these deals, when you're advising your clients, you know typically there are these like stumbling blocks. I think valuation has traditionally been you know there's always been a bit of a price disconnect between sort of a seller's expectations and, and the buyer's view of reality. In your, in your words, um, what, what are like basically, and I'm, I'm sort of getting into execution a little bit here, what are the main challenges, um, legal, financial, 
practice in executing a deal. You know, you've got the rationale is there. You've got a you've got your buyer, you've got your seller, you've got the asset, whatever. What keeps you up at night about getting the deal done? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, um, I'll I'll start off with the financial side of things. I think looking at valuations um, is quite an interesting uh, discussion to have, and the reason for that is when you look at an LTM basis, last twelve month basis, or trailing twelve month basis, you know how does one look at it? You know how does one treat the last four months? Um, do you look at an average of the last three years? Um, how does one even project the future? How do you look at it from a markets multiples? trading comparables, transaction comparables basis, because suddenly the market's out of whack, right? There's been a, uh, as I said, a, a pause button pressed on the world. Um, uh, uh, businesses, both from an income statement as well as a balance sheet perspective are out of whack, so to speak. So how does one really look at valuations in that respect? So I think that that's one discussion. Secondly, if you move away from the market side of the discussion and you look at DCF, how does one now project future cash flows? How do you discount future cash flows? What is if you look at the, the capital markets, if you look at the debt side of things, interest rates are at the lowest they've ever been. If you look at the equity premium, how does one look at that as an example? So valuations becomes an interesting discussion. And to shift the discussion away from the bid offer spread being quite wide, one needs to start thinking about structured transactions. And by structured transactions, how can you make sure you have deferred considerations? How can you ensure that you can structure earnouts? How can you uh, uh, ensure that you structure out um, transactions and payments in a way that are um, linked to some sort of event in the future or alternatively the performance of the business per se? Um, and I think that becomes interesting because fundamentally we're talking about, apart from the large transactions that we all know of and are near and dear to our hearts, apart from those, when we look at the more mid cap side of things, you're talking about transactions that are more difficult to do from a pure cash perspective. So the question here is, you know, um, are you looking at a transaction to enhance your own income statement? Or are you looking at a transaction to uh, ensure the safety of your balance sheet? So the impetus behind getting transactions now relative to 12 months ago are quite different. In the past, in the lot, in 12 months ago, you're looking at enhancing your income statement. You're looking at buying EBITDA. At what multiples are you buying those EBITDA? You're looking at synergies across your cost structure. How can you ensure that you can increase your margins? How do you buy margin fundamentally, right? How can you increase your top line? So the discussions were very much income statement focused. Now, when you're having those discussions, especially on the mid cap side, they're more balance sheet focused. How can you strengthen the capital structure? How can you strengthen the balance sheet? And to, to Madge's point, there's some wonderful companies out there. You know, this was a black swan event of sorts. How can one ensure that you can get a transaction done that benefits both parties? And fundamentally, we're seeing on the mid cap side, consolidation being the name of the game. And that's consolidation to ensure you have much more resilient, stronger businesses that come out at the end of that. On the uh, large cap side, we're seeing much more strategic transactions occurring and um, income statements um, um, fundamentally uh, 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 looking at cash coming into businesses or cash going into uh, uh, share for shareholders. So they're cash type transactions, which they allow that cash to then be reinvested back into the business to make sure that that business is much more resilient uh, and prime for growth and creating a platform for those businesses that are growth. So when you look at these large cap transactions and the nature of the buyers and the sellers, they're different and the impetus and the catalyst behind that is quite different. When you look at these medium sized businesses, the mid cap transactions, the catalyst and impetus behind those transactions are quite different. So it really depends on where you want to be. So that's from a financial uh, perspective. When it goes to documentation and legal, the question around due diligence becomes important. You know, what type of information is available in a world where communication in itself is not that easy? So uh, diligence yeah. becomes obviously harder. So um, the support required, and we obviously have a very strong diligence practice who are very, very busy and, 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 and kind of really going in there and supporting our clients, you know, it requires us to roll up our sleeves more. It requires us to, for us to look a little bit deeper when it comes to the due diligence um, and, and for, when it comes to normalizations, and looking at exceptional items, there's more work required on that 
front to ensure that we are uh, indeed looking at all the nooks and crannies and under the, the boulders and the, and, and the stones, so to speak. So due diligence becomes an important discussion, then moving it to your, to your domain, Hissam, how does legal documentation work in that respect? Because legal documentation is fundamentally, fundamentally speaking, uh, two elements to that. One is, what have you got from the due diligence? Can you um, reaffirm the non-binding offer? Can you make it a binding offer? And if not, how can you make sure that clients are protected sufficiently, whether it's reps, warranties, indemnity, however you want to structure that, how do you translate the lack of due diligence into legal documentation on one end? And then additionally, on the legal documentation side, on the SPA side, how do you ensure that you can bring in the valuation discussions into that as well. So yes, it requires a little bit more work. I think your classic way of thinking about these transactions from an execution perspective 12 months ago versus now is different. And fundamentally, one needs to be quite fluid in their approach to ensure what are the important points, what are the headline risks, and explain those headline lists to your client and make sure that they can digest them accordingly and hence articulate those into the definitive agreements. Yeah. So hopefully I've, I've touched on a couple of the points there. Yeah? No, those are those are the, the very salient ones, uh, e even for lawyers. Uh, I'm curious, Ahmed, uh, what is the what is the what does the world like, look like in terms of, of leveraged acquisitions? I mean, do you see do you see people, local buyers, um, taking on debt acquisition? I mean, what what's the state of the world when it comes to acquisition finance regionally? I mean, tr traditionally it hasn't been uh, a, a real viable. A source of capital to, for, to to fund a deal, but uh, has has that changed? Okay, and and I think I'll, I'll address that if if I may. I think there was kind of a topic just a, a moment ago that I'd like to just sort of um, put a maybe quite a direct view for for the purpose of of the audience. I think the question was around restructuring distress and and liquidity. Um, you know, I'd say that our view is that there is quite likely to be a material inflow of restructuring related activity coming into the market, most likely coming into uh, the market towards the back end uh, of the year. We've obviously seen in the region some quite notable situations of restructuring that, to be honest, may have um, elements of governance, related elements uh, to that. But by and large, banks have been very, very supportive of um, you know, of industry players in this, in, in this market environment, certainly with sort of interest and, and principle um, holidays that cannot, in in our view, continue forever. And you know, and with the the best willingness to to manage and the foresight to manage this from the authorities with respect to you know um, items of stimulus, whether it's running capital buffers, you know, lower and and, and providing flexibility. Ultimately, you know, um, ultimately, uh, provisioning needs to be made and, and actions need to be taken. And I think it's imperative for you know clients to be thinking through, you know what would be their what would be their options, um, you know to the extent that liquidity becomes considerably tougher, right? So I think I just wanted to sort of address that. And for us, we've been um, we've been very active in the distressed M and A space, and also uh, foreseeing you know what's likely to come as a firm we've partnered with EJT, who have a global leading restructuring uh, practice. And so, you know, we see it as a very important topic with clients. Um, so, so maybe I'll just sort of, um, you know, yeah. and, uh, just, to, just to interrupt you on that point, Ahmed, because it, I, on the restructuring, it's interesting. I'm curious to know, and I am also to get Madge's view on this. Has have restructuring deals sort of matured to the le level of sophistication, whereby you know, um, borrowers would would, I mean. You know, traditionally it's been just deferring payments or like reprofiling the debt or maybe retranching the debt or something. But do we do we have now restructurings where where you'll get new instruments issued to the creditors and I mean is you know and and maybe divestments will be part of that package. Is that where we are or are we still a way to go before we do those more creative restructurings? I, I think you know the the honest answer here is we are not entirely comparable um, and sophisticated as in other parts of the world. Um, I think, you know, lenders, largely speaking, and banks, you know, uh, specifically as the um, um, the providers of the lion's share of, of, of debt to businesses in our part of the world, um, aren't set up today, uh, quite honestly, um, you know, to 
um, get into a deal whereby they swap, you know, their debt, you know, for uh, for equity, uh, uh, and or um, you know, swap, you know, the debt, you know, for an asset, um, uh, and then for them, you know, to run that office, manage manage that uh, asset, and you know, to sell it. Um, are we improving from the global financial crisis? Yes, I would say because today, unlike you know, um, um, 10, 12 years ago, um, you know, many of these banks, you know, have recruited, um, um, you know, have turnarounds and restructuring, you know, professionals. So um, there is a greater willingness, you know, to try, you know, to think about um, restructuring the debt, uh, but it is more akin to reprofiling and refinancing, as opposed to thinking about, you know, um, um, more aggressive um, um, actions uh, a more aggressive approaches into how a certain bank or a certain group of banks which have an exposure to a good business um which happens to be over levered um, um you know that can de can deal with it um i'm positive that you know we are um, um advancing we are progressing we are developing um but i guess you know the 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 the, the unfortunate response is we're still not there yet. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, and let's let's be frank and let's be reasonable as well. Um, this part of the world hasn't witnessed and hasn't lived large scale crisis in the same way the developed world, you know, have witnessed. And therefore, we are still on that learning curve. We're still um, trying, you know, to um, um, instill um, a new stuff into those restructuring and every and each time, you know, we face a crisis. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and the journey goes on. And I think the direction is, is very good and very promising, but we, we, you know, there is some way to go. Um, Ahmed and, and Tahir, just so I just wanted to get like, like the use of leverage to do deals. Is that is that something that's taking hold here? Has it come? Yeah. Um, are you seeing it? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing we're seeing it um, a fair amount, to, to be honest. Uh, much more so in financial sponsor deals, which I think I think you'd expect, right? Uh, you know that are that are geared and very return focused over over a time frame, and, and we're working, hopefully, actually cl closing <laughs> closing one this month. But generally, uh, very active. It's not easy in this environment. I think it's not easy in um, in the current situation to be onboarded as as a new client. So certainly, any of you sort of coming, uh, you know, fund you're talking about sort of coming into kind of a, a new business is very difficult. For having um, sort of clients getting onboarded, if it's a, a strategic and they've got existing relationships, and trying to use you know the existing banks to support uh, an acquisition is important. And I think for for sponsors, you know there there is still you know appetite. As I said, liquidity isn't isn't optimal right now. And so where we've seen more appetite has probably been from you know more wholesale banks that are looking at that segment of acquisition financing, trying to get a bit more margin um, and are still basically uh, willing to participate. But we've seen a little bit of a shying away, uh, I'd say, um, on, on the acquisition financing front generally. Yes, right. at least not. Not, not. not surprised really to hear that. Um, uh, just, I think there might be a few sort of deal practitioners on, on the call. I, you know, obviously, the documentation is important. Us lawyers care a lot about that. That's what we're there to do. Now, post-COVID, during COVID, there's been some evolution in terms. Um, you're seeing things like like earnouts. I've worked on a couple of deals here that that have earnouts uh, as part of the consideration. These are very sort of controversial in that they are well in the West. They're very litigious uh, provisions. Uh, they're hard to get right, frankly. Um, Things like earnouts, a deferred consideration, maybe changing the way you value uh, from a lockbox, which is something you do at signing and then you sort of forget about it. And that's so as long as there's no value leakage, that's what you're going to pay at closing. Going from that to completion accounts, um, are these, you know, putting in more expansive MAC outs and, and putting in interim covenants? Are these, I, I you know, are you seeing, um, that sort of practice being adopted here um, and to what extent? Uh, maybe, Tahir, you can, if you've sure. got any insight into that. 
Yeah, with pleasure. I think I think you're you're exactly right. I think we're, we're, we've gone from a sh shifting world of what we um, saw historically, um, which is lockbox, as you as you mentioned, uh, moving more towards completion accounts. And I think the risk appetite of um, uh, buyers um, is is significantly less now. They want much more certainty in the cash flows and the valuation by definition that they're paying for. Um, so we're seeing much more um, onerous. Uh, wording around valuation within the SPA. We're seeing uh, a much more uh, uh, restrictions uh, within the SPA to ensure that uh, the business continuity uh, is something that is uh, that is provided for. So I completely agree with yourself. I think there's much more uh, stringent eye and eagle eye when it comes to documentation uh, uh, right now. Uh, at, least, at least that's that's what we see, and and it's understandable because uh, we're in an environment which is you know uh, quite volatile. Uh, earnings are quite volatile. Businesses' performance uh, performances are quite volatile. So the more certainty a buyer can get, um, that's the kind of world uh, we are in right now. Uh, I think uh, you know minimizing risk uh, is is the name of the game for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and but you know when you look at the rebound that uh, that we've been talking about just in recent weeks, I think it almost seems like negotiating leverage, in, at least in certain sectors, will return to the seller. Uh, and in, in in quick order, even I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I, I want to put maybe uh, um, imagine on the spot uh, a little bit um, as well and ask him. And this is uh, this is coming out of a question um, in terms of regulation uh, in the region generally, but maybe even specifically in the UAE. Uh, obviously, lots of, lot, lots have been done. I mean, the the, the vision is there, but what what would you what do you think needs um, to be addressed, changed. If you had to change one or two things, in it doesn't have to be regulation, but you know, in, in the sort of infrastructural resources that are available for, uh, for people to do deals, um, whether you are an advisor or you are the target or you are a buyer, what are the things that can be changed to make that space more vibrant? Uh, I, I guess, you know, I'm, uh, Hussam, improvement and or introduction of a new regulation that allows households, small businesses, uh, and uh, entrepreneurs, you know, benefit from a strong um, technology, um, you know, networks in the country. However, you know, supported by, um, you know, regulation that allows them, you know, to do more online, is, is rather important. And I think in that respect, um, you know, COVID, you know, came and, you know, we have been able, you know, to see that um, um, uh, people, you know, have been able, you know, to do, you know, Zoom calls and, you know, WhatsApps and whatever. Um, I think, you know, some form of opening in that respect will, will reflect very positively on the emergence of new ideas, interesting ideas, new businesses, um, that you know could be based locally, but would have certainly a regional and a global reach in the UCOS. Right, All right, and I, I I think we we ought to say something about that kind of ecosystem of startups and SMEs uh, because that is an important part of of well the UAE. We you know we're seeing more and more activity uh, and. We, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't just talk about the, the, the hotshot deals. Um, I mean, in, in your in your mind, Ahmed, I mean, this is, you, you're probably not sort of invest, you know, your clients are probably not, I don't know, I don't know if they're looking at startup companies or, or pre cash flow companies, but, you know, there's a lot of activity. What, what do you think can be done to make, to make them, I don't know, better recipients of capital and, I mean, again, this speaks to M and A, but uh, obviously, in developed markets, there are so many sources of capital geared towards startups. Here, we have venture funds, yes, here and there. But what's your read? What's your read on that particular segment? Uh, start the startup world. I mean, there are people on this call, I'm sure, in in, in startups. So interested in yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, and 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 I think you're right. I mean, th there is capital um, available in in the region. 
it's a good thing to debate as to whether there's sufficient capital that's allocated uh, in the region within the startup space. Obviously, there are sort of four to five notable uh, VC funds and and money that's that's making its way. But certainly, you know, we're in a region where there's a lot of liquidity and there should be, you know, a lot of scope for funds to be to be made available. And and having seen uh, the progress of, you know, many of these startups, some some of which approach us, which are quite right, maybe a, a too early stage for us. Um, it's clear that the spirit of entrepreneurship is very high in in this part of the world. And um, and I think you know the the challenges. Uh, that people face w with respect to funding are, are no no different than that to to any other business in terms of having a clear vision, a clear path, um, a clear sort of differentiating factor to to their businesses. And you know, I think you know one of the challenges, particularly as you start looking at sort of startups that are more, let's say, in, in the tech space, you know, and whether we're talking about sort of e-commerce and and others, is you know it, it's a race. If you know the funding is going to come in, you know where's the ultimate end goal? What can you achieve in in these particular market spaces? And and I think that that is also you know uh, a challenge for for some. But certainly, yeah. um, you know certainly it's a you know there's a there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurship within within the Gulf and within the Middle East more broadly, and there are funds available. I think it would be great if there were if there were more. Quite frankly, right, right. Uh, well, we, we are coming to the, to, to the witching hour. I, I have a couple of questions. I think maybe we'll tack on two or three minutes. Question for Majid. Uh, there is a question of specifically about um, regulation of certain sectors to help growth and acceleration of M&A or I presume investment in science, tech and telemedicine. I think you even might have mentioned these. Um, uh, I guess the question is how far do you think regulation has come to facilitate this and how much more needs to be done? I, I think, you know, the good news is the government of the UAE, um, through the some of the recent announcements, seems to be quite focused, you know, on pushing the agenda of um, um, easing, um, you know, certain restrictions, um, um, improving, you know, regulation, uh, um, as well as, you know, liberalization of certain legacy practices. I think all of this, um, you know, should give us some form of comfort that as we um, as we march into the future, um, um, you know, some of these you know, um, science tech and you know um, um, other you know um, um, tele related uh, commercial activities um, would likely be beneficiaries of such opening up uh, and improved you know regulation. Got it. I think, super. I, I hope that addresses the, the question. One last question has come in. I think it's an interesting sort of practice point. Uh, I don't know if Ahmad and Tara, you want to have a stab at this. Rep and warranty insurance, right? So this is obviously very popular in the West. I think it's seeping over. Are you seeing it? Is, is this something, is, are there products out there that, that, are, um, that you're using uh, for, for your, to protect the buyers? Yeah, I'll have to take that in there, Ahmed. It'll be great to get your thoughts as well. Um, so W9 insurance is something that we've seen more so over the last few years. Um, I think um, the way in which obviously it works. I, is, is, I mean, I, I'm, are you seeing local insurers providing this product? Is we, we see bro no, we, we see brokers uh, primarily out of the UK who have access to uh, insurance companies who indeed uh, provide W9 insurance. There are specific brokers that act as intermediaries between those uh, institutions uh, who uh, provide this product uh, um, uh, and, and, and it's as a percentage of the total deal value uh, uh, and, and that's what the premium fundamentally is and they go through the SPA when you're in the kind of you know last couple of drafts of the SPA um, or maybe a little bit earlier you, you, you share with them uh, the SPA they actually go through the reps and the warranties and they assess the risk um, so we are seeing that. I mean, if you ask me this question seven, eight years ago, I'd say, no, not going on, doesn't happen personally. And Ahmed, it'll be great to get your thoughts on Majid as well. Um, I saw this kind of happening over the last three, four years, uh, and we saw it percol uh, percolating more, I'd say, over the last 24 months. Personally, I'd be interested to see how this now moves forward. 
given the fact that they it was coming to the fore and given the fact that we were seeing more w and insurance um, in our transactions, I'll be interested to see moving forward whether that continues, accelerates the pace um, or not. Um, over to yourself, Ahmed and Majid, it'd be great to get your thoughts. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I'd agree with uh, Tahir. I think certainly, um, so sort of eight, ten years ago, you were not seeing, you know, any uh, W&I in, in its sort of warranty and indemnity insurance in, in the market. Um, it, over the last four years, started to be introduced. I think that, if anything, it's more likely to to increase, because if, if you look at it from the perspective, you know, once you're providing this type of insurance in a new market, you, you're obviously going to have experience, right? It's an insurance product, right? And so the, the more that this basically takes hold, the more efficiency there'll be in understanding the risks and in pricing the risks. And to be honest, the more likely I think it, we're going to see this as being, you know, a good, compelling product, you know, within the marketplace. So I think it's it's only likely to continue, um, and I think it's only it's only a good thing. It's it's part of, you know, I think the increasing sophistication that, that we're seeing, you know, within within the market space for 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 doing deals basically in, in the region. I'll, I'll, that, maybe, that was, I'll maybe just add to that this time, if I may. I completely agree with Ahmed. I think we'll see more of it, but it'll come at the expense of, you know, the seller fundamentally, right? So, you know, so, 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 someone, you know, someone's going to have to pay for this. Where will it get hit? Valuation will get hit fundamentally, right? So, right. you know, we need to be a little bit smarter with the way we maybe structure those transactions. Yeah, but I agree completely with Ahmed. Right, and it's a hard, other whole channel of due diligence and 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 legal work, frankly, for the for the insurer to get comfortable. But look, that that was we'll end on that sort of very uh, specific practice note. But it's an interesting one. It's a it's an interesting development. Look, I'll take this opportunity. We've run over a, a bit, but it's been a terrific conversation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, Majid, Ahmed, and Tahir. Um, and I uh, really appreciate your your insights. Um, and I'm going to now hand it back over to Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Hassam, uh, Ahmed, Majid, and Tahir. This has been interesting. It's been insightful and so many very important points uh, shared. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you also all of those of you who've been listening to this webcast and the others in the series so far. We are going to take a break now for four weeks, then we're going to return in September. Uh, the first webcast coming out then is uh, economists from one of our biggest banks helping us make sense of the macroeconomic trends we can see around us. Till then, have a good continued summer. And in the meantime, please let us know what you want to hear of. And of course, if you have expertise to share, your input and your participation is what makes this webcast series. Thank you all very much. Goodbye.